The next item of business is debate on motion 16012 in the name of Mark Griffin on the Carers Allowance Supplement. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start this debate by thanking carers for the tremendous work they do every single day caring for loved ones. Tomorrow, the Scottish Parliament will consider its first set of instruments to uprate a devolved social security benefit, carers' allowance. And like the passing of the Best Start grant and funeral expense instruments, this moment should not simply pass us by. This should be a moment when new powers are used for real change for people in Scotland. These are critical regulations that will boost the incomes of carers, but an increase of 2.4%, equivalent to September's CPI rate, just doesn't go far enough. That's why we're challenging the government to abandon CPI and to readopt RPI for uprating Scottish Social Security. Making clear, our new powers will be used to invest in the people of Scotland with carers afforded the dignity and respect they deserve. I'd like, I'd like to make a, a bit of progress. I, I'll, I'll take the member um, later on. But, President Officer, our, our motion today builds on the call the National Carer Organisations made in their submission to the Social Security Bill, where they said this should be linked to retail price index, not consumer price index. Added to that, voices across the third sector support the motion. The Alliance, SCVO, Energy Action Scotland and Marie Curie, to name a few, have all been in touch to say they support using RPI. Used by Labour um, to uprate Social Security, RPI is generally more generous and crucially takes account of housing costs. The change to CPI, the change to CPI, the rate the government are offering now was one of George Osborne's first welfare cuts in 2010. I'll take uh, Jeremy Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, can I thank the member for that? Can you tell me how much would it cost to implement this plan this year and the next following two years? Mark Griffin. Spice have done uh, the work on the modelling and estimate it would cost uh, three million pounds, a point I'm coming to later on in the speech, but I think this is more about just the cost of uprating um, carers' allowance. This is about a principle in social security when we look at the whole range of devolved uh, benefits and how we uprate them to make sure they keep up with the cost of living. And as I said, that changed the CPI. The, the rate the government are offering now was one of George Osborne's first welfare cuts in 2010. And it seems that the SNP government is entirely content with that, displaying dogmatic support for CPI in their motion and arguments lifted straight from a George Osborne budget. Now, RPI is no panacea, no measure is. In this case, carers are being shortchanged with the government using the cheapest possible option. Yep. Kate Forbes. And I thank the member for, his, for allowing me to make the intervention. And I uh, agree with his point about carers being important. This is less than a week since stage three of the budget. Why was this not a Labour Party ask in the budget? Yep. Mark Griffin. As I've already said, this is much wider. That this is this this is much wider than a single year budget. This is about the full range of devolved benefits. This is about setting a precedent as we go on for using the cheapest possible option to uprate devolved social security benefits. And this point, Labour are saying, no, we are not happy with that. Carers and everyone who does, who relies on social security deserve better. Now. When it comes to peak rail fares, um, surprisingly, um, the SNP are happy for those to be uprated by RPI. Mm -hmm. The public sector pay increase will be 3%. Figures released today show bus fares have risen by 3% and council tax bills look set to rise by 4.8%. So why, why are we giving carers just 2.4%? And according to the TUC, the switch to CPI and Social Security has cost people billions. The policy sits on the same shelf as the benefits freeze with the impact accumulating every single year. It's a cut to save the government money at the expense of people in need and is responsible for pushing families, carers 
and disabled people to food banks as they struggle to make ends meet. And the Cabinet Secretary knows it. The Cabinet Secretary knows it. Her own briefings confirm that the Tory-led coalition uprating policies will have slashed £1.9 billion from incomes by 2021 in Scotland. Time and, time and time again, we hear from SNP speakers rightly calling out the Tory government for cuts to social security amounting to £3.9 billion in Scotland by 2021. But they lose all credibility in using that figure now since they wholeheartedly support George Osborne's change from RPI to CPI, which again, according to the Cabinet Secretary's own briefing, has contributed significantly to £1.9 billion of those cuts. And we can use our powers to support 82,000 carers with an extra £33 next year and depart from that Tory cut. And the government rightly point out that the supplement supported right across this chamber is an uplift truly appreciated by carers. But ministers surely don't think that's the limit of the support we offer carers. After all, next year the supplement will still be at £150 short of the extra £600 the First Minister promised in 2015. And Spice calculates a move to RPI would cost £3 million next year. And our motion proposes that it's paid through the supplement because we recognise that would be the only way to do it. And that's because the SNP's deal with the DWP costing an, ex an estimated £6 million next year means we can't change a single part of the underlying carers allowance until at least autumn next year. It means we can't block the aggressive recovery action against those who have been overpaid or help recipients access full-time education. And as Marie Curie point out, we can't extend the time carers receive the allowance when their loved one sadly dies or go on, uh, goes into hospital long term. And President Officer, I want to point out one final quirk of the decision to stick um, with agency agreements. The government proposes to, um, that the earnings threshold for carers allowance should rise by just three pounds next year. And that means a carer who earns a penny more than 123 pound cliff edge risks losing their allowance entirely. Out of step with the increases in the national and real living wages, that is clearly a disincentive to carers working. The SPICE analysis shows that a carer on the national living wage would be allowed to work a maximum of 15 hours a week, and that's 20 minutes fewer than they were able to work this year, or they lose that allowance altogether. But what advice will the Cabinet Secretary give to a carer who has to go to their employer and ask that they reduce their working hours or lose carers' allowance? That's not right. It's too high a burden on Scotland's carers and an area where carers and organisations have repeatedly demanded change. But, President Officer, we have powers to take a, a different path to show that social security is an investment in the people of Scotland. Now is the time to set the precedent and readopt RPI in Scotland's social security system. I move the amendment in my name. It's a motion you have to move. <laughs> President officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. Can I say we're already over time for this debate, so it's going to have to come off of other speakers. And I call Shirley Ann Somerville for up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. When it comes to carers, the financial commitment of this government is clear through the Carers Allowance Supplement. We've already put an extra £442 into the pockets of over 77 carers. This is an increase in carers allowance of 13% and an investment of over £33 million through this benefit alone. In five years' time, carers in Scotland will be receiving approximately £491 more than carers out with Scotland due to our supplement. And we've also committed to the introduction of a, a young carers grant and will introduce a new payment for carers uh, who are responsible for more than one disabled child. All of this new money is of course in the context of new social care support and rights for carers through the Carers Scotland Act which came into force last year and this government has fully funded the implementation of the Carers Act including providing an additional £10.5 million in 2019-20 to enable local government to meet the projected increase in demand for support of the Act. And I'll take an intervention from Claudia Beamish. Right, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Um, 
when the uplift was announced by the First Minister, when I happened to be in the uh, co-convener of the cross-party group for carers in 2015, it was due to be worth £600 an annum. But at the, at the launch, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, in 2018, it was 442 per annum. Does the member not accept there's still a long way to go to meet the First Minister's commitment? Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, again, I, I would make the point to, to Claudia Beamish and to the other uh, Labour members who will take part in this debate. If you are concerned about the amount for the carers' allowance supplement, where were you during the budget? Absolutely. Where were your proposals on this? Because we are but a week since that process has passed, and I didn't see any serious proposals coming in from anyone in the Labour Party on carers or anything else. Presiding officer, the response to the carers' allowance supplement has been hugely positive and we know we're doing the right thing in making this increase. And when it comes to uprating, we'll do the right thing too. Our proposal is based on evidence and importantly, internationally accepted good practice. The measure we propose is the one that accurately reflects the cost of living, the consumer price index. Now, I agree with the Conservative amendment in that we should always under, keep under review any alternative methods. So I'd like to give Miles Briggs and the rest of the Chamber my full reassurance that this is something that we already do. For example, we have considered CPIH, which is also recommended by the ONS. CPIH is similar to CPI in how it is calculated, but it includes additional items. However, for over the past nine years, CPIH inflation has been lower than CPI in seven of those years. Therefore, using this would have delivered a lower increase to carers. Through CPI from this April, Scotland's carers will see their carers' allowance increase from £64.60 to £66.15 weekly. This approach is in line with the agency agreement we have set up with the DWP to deliver carers' loans on our behalf, and the agreement enabled us to get much-needed increases into the pockets of carers as early as last summer, a matter of weeks after the Social Security Scotland Act was granted through the introduction of the carers' allowance supplement. Certainly. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank the member for taking intervention. But I wonder if she could answer the question as to why RPI is used for rail fares, but CPI is to be used for carers. Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, there are historical areas where it is particularly used, but it is um, discouraged by the Office of National Statistics, a point I will come on to. And we are setting up a new system here, and I think it is important that we listen to that good practice and advice. So when we take over full delivery of carers' assistance, we will work with stakeholders to agree a mechanism to uprate carers' assistance, and this will, of course, be done with members of the Parliament. I'm happy to discuss any ideas and hear the views from all the parties and members as our social security system develops. What I won't do is agree to what is considered by experts to be a poor measure of inflation. Now, CPI is used for the Bank of England's inflation target. The Office of National Statistics describes describe CPI as a measure produced to international standards and in line with European regulations. By contrast, here is what the Office of National Statistics say about the retail price index, or RPI. Overall, RPI is a very poor measure of general inflation, at times greatly overestimating and at other times greatly underestimating changes in prices and how these changes are experienced. Not only is RPI widely regarded as an inappropriate inflation measure, it has been used as such over five years. In 2013, the UK Statistics Authority, the arm's length body that oversees the Office of National Statistics, said RPI has been assessed against the Code of Practice for Official Statistics and found not to meet the required standard for designation as national statistics. The consensus amongst economists and statisticians is that RPI does not meet international standards. Now, that is an opinion shared by many, I except those, of course, close, and my parliamentary colleagues in the Labour Party. Now, I appreciate a discussion has to be had about levels of benefits. That is right and that is proper. The place for that is during the budget process that we've just been through and of which Labour were not to be seen. It is vital that we keep the decisions on uprating of benefits separate from benefit levels. And our aim in choosing an uprating mechanism is to ensure that the benefit levels we agree on maintain their value over time. And the CPI is the best mechanism to do just that. I move the amendment to my name. Uh, Miles Briggs, up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The support we provide and well-being of Scotland's carers is something which we should all be concerned. I therefore welcome uh, the Labour Party bringing this debate forward today. 
As an MSP, I've attended every summer the Scottish Young Carers Festival. The festival provides the chance for young carers to have a break from their caring role, meet other young carers, take part in consultation, but perhaps most importantly, just to have fun. What always has amazed me is how these young Scots often do not even see themselves as young carers. It's just their mum or dad or brother and sister. There are at least 759,000 carers of the age of 16 and above in Scotland and 29,000 young carers. The value of care provided to care by carers in Scotland is estimated to be the equivalent to the taxpayer of £10 billion a year. So I think it's important we remind ourselves today that three out of five of us will become carers at some stage in our lives and one in ten of us already are fulfilling some of these caring roles. How we support carers in Scotland today and in the future is therefore incredibly important. It's vital that we get our social support system right and fit for purpose and that, and that is why we have supported and called for the introduction of the carers allowance supplement and why we on these benches support a wider look at how we support Scotland's carers and the challenges they face. The useful briefing which has already been mentioned which Marie Curie provided ahead of today's debate outlined how many people caring for someone with a terminal illness do not get identified as carers, so do not get the support including access to benefits they may be entitled to. And there are many opportunities therefore I think we need to look at to identifying carers who are, and who are supporting someone at the end of their life and clearly this needs to be improved. I very much welcome initiatives such as a pop-up hub for carers, which we saw uh, last week at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, to help provide this information and reach out to identify carers. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Conservatives want to see carers supported in Scotland to make sure that they're able to live healthy, fulfilling lives, and the crucial role that they play in our communities is both recognised and valued. For this to happen, a range of good quality support needs to be on hand to carers at the right time and the right place. My amendment for today's debate calls on ministers to actually investigate the use of these alternative methods in going forward and uprating. Every party in this chamber has made a commitment to deliver a Scottish social security system based on dignity and respect and one that recognises the immense value that carers bring to our society. We on these benches want to look towards how we can further support and thank Scotland's carers. Scottish Conservatives have long campaigned on behalf of carers from measures such as the increase in the carers allowance to our campaign for local authorities to give short breaks to carers. So SNP ministers, I believe, should be open to different methods of uprating benefits and to actually look at these. It's also important that we see this in the wider context of the benefit system and wider package of support for carers in Scotland. The delay, for example, in delivering free bus travel to those in receipt of the Young Carers Grant until 2020-2021 has been raised with me by many young carers groups in my own region of Lothian. And I believe this is something ministers can look at and should make more of a priority. Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, my amendment today asks ministers to investigate the use of alternative methods of uprating the full sum of carer's allowance, as well as the carer's allowance supplement. Scottish Conservatives believe it is important we get this right, and we take a considered and long-term approach to these issues, and my amendment will give Parliament this evening the opportunity to do just that. I move the amendment in my name. For the benefit of the official report, I forgot to say earlier that was Amendment 16012.1. I now call Alison Johnson. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We can't thank carers in Scotland enough, yet it remains the case that people who care are undervalued and underpaid, despite the fact that unpaid carers save the Scottish economy some £10.8 billion annually, there remains a vast mismatch between the value of care and the support carers receive. Three out of five of us will become carers at some point in our lives, yet the value of work that carers do isn't fully recognised. And payments to carers don't recognise the enormous contribution made by unpaid carers. The Scottish Greens stood on a manifesto commitment in 2016 to campaign for an increase in carers' allowance payments to £93.15 per week. That would be £96.90 per week today. And today we will support the Labour motion, which calls for the use of an uprating mechanism that is more generous to carers. And I appreciate that the Scottish Government made a manifesto commitment to, to increase carers' allowance uh, to the same level as job seekers' allowance. That's progress. I welcome it. But I will continue to urge the Government and indeed the Parliament to go further. Greens have long called for a lower threshold for hours of care and importantly for more flexibility. 
surely one person caring for two people, yet still reaching that threshold, should be receiving carer's allowance. And I know that the previous Cabinet Secretary was not unsympathetic to those calls, and I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's response. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has taken up the call in that Green 2016 manifesto for a young carer's grant. The First Minister responded to that call quickly. I have four minutes. I have four minutes. I, I would like to progress. Evidence suggests that it's the most financially vulnerable young people who are most likely to have caring responsibilities. Now, this grant will enable young carers support worth £300 per year. It will contribute to ensuring that young carers can take part in activities like going to the cinema, perhaps having some driving lessons, for example. But we have to ensure that the 29,000 young people in Scotland who care are properly and fully supported and that their education and their personal development is prioritised. Carers UK, Carer UK's Caring and Family Finances Inquiry found that 70% of carers were £10,000 a year worse off and that one in three had seen a drop of £20,000 a year in their household income as a result of caring. So being a carer can lead to additional financial costs such as an increase in household bills. And that's why we urgently need to examine increasing the value of social security payments to carers. The carers allowance top up is a good first step, but more can be done. As part of its work on preparing for the delivery of carers, assistant, a carers assistance, I'd like to see the Scottish Government doing all that it can to properly understand the financial impact of caring on carers and to understand what the devolved social security system can do to help. We also need to look at how we value particularly intensive forms of care. Current rules only allow payments in respect of one cared for person, but we know thousands of Scots care for more than one person. That brings additional costs. The government intends to do this, uh, where people care for more than one disabled child. That is welcome. But let's take a broader view and consider everyone who cares for more than one person. There's an unfairness too under current UK rules that people caring for more than one person but less than 35 hours miss out entirely. I will raise again today the issue of take-up. Carer payments have a particular issue with take-up. I think Mark Griffin mentioned this. Some people don't even realise they're a carer. They don't see themselves as carers in a formal sense. Um, take-up of the Best Start grant suggests that we can do more to increase take-up and I'd be interested to hear the Minister's comments um, on that issue too. In closing, presiding officer, without carers, the independence and quality of life for many is reduced. The burden on our health service has increased. It's one of the most important jobs in our society. And those of us in this parliament have a duty to make sure that all carers, paid and unpaid, are valued and have the support they deserve. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Labour Party for securing time for this uh, today? It's important that we recognise the um, input and the contribution that our unpaid carers make to our society. It's something I recognise that they raise time and time again, and it's right for them to challenge us in this way. Because on any given day, there are 171,000 carers in Scotland who are um, working on a more than full-time basis. We couldn't hope to pay them a salary. We couldn't hope to pay them for the work that they deliver, but instead this state relies and arguably exploits the love that they have for their family members and those around them and the caring responsibility that they feel uh, as a, that naturally exists in terms of their relationship. So it's absolutely right that you keep raising this. Um, and the hostile environment that exists in terms of public policy is very real when it, terms to, uh, when it comes to carers. In terms of identification, only 9% of those presenting at GPs who are carers actually recognise their caring status. Um, that's particularly worse for young carers, and it's something that I think that children who are growing up only knowing one reality don't often recognise that they're any different from anyone else, and it's absolutely vital we get to them. There's often hurdles that people have to cro uh, cross when getting a family relative for whom they are caring an official diagnosis because uh, no support is triggered until that diagnosis is forthcoming. And then once that diagnosis does exist, there is the difficult and opaque landscape of public benefits uh, that people have to navigate. 
Uh, this should be something that we can unite across the chamber on. And so it was actually that uh, my party and the SNP had a very similar policy on this going into the Scottish parliamentary elections of 2016 of uplifting the uh, carers allowance to the level of job seekers allowance. That's why we'll support their amendment tonight. And uh, so it was that on the 10th of September last year, we finally, finally got that uh, over the line and we gave carers that additional £452 per year. It's a significant uplift. I have sympathy with what Labour are trying to do here, uh, but I believe that the, the shifting from the CPI to the RPI uh, will only amount to a small amount of money uh, per individual. We have to look at the whole package of support that we offer, and if we want to give our carers more money, which I think we should probably aspire to do, then we should give them meaningful uplifts beyond the rate of inflation. We should also look to the uh, paucity of respite care. Less than a quarter of full-time carers actually receive any kind of respite support. That isn't because they don't know about it, it's just because it doesn't exist in a lot of parts of this country or is beyond their financial reach or the amount that the local authorities or those around them have agreed that they will support them to that end. I also support, I uh, have to say, Marie Curie's call, and I thank them for the briefing that they gave us. They always give us briefings around the support they offer carers, uh, but their call for extending the payment threshold after the person who is being cared for has died. We often forget what a, a tumultuous time that is. Obviously, it's a devastating time for the carer when they lose the person that they have been caring for. But on top of that, they, we expect them as a state to go back to normalcy. To, to re restart full-time employment, perhaps, or, or whatever. So we need to go far beyond um, the, the, the sort of extension of eight weeks of payment after death to the full six months that Marie Curie uh, suggests, because I think that will give carers that opportunity to get their feet back under them and to, to start to, to re-establish uh, a working life. I do thank Labour for taking the time to give us this debate in Parliament today. I understand what they're trying to do, but I think we also need to look at this in the round. I look forward to working with them in the coming weeks and months to establishing common ground in this area. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. We are already over time for this debate, so can I ask all speakers to aim for three and a half minutes, please? Elaine Smith, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Shoot me a bit by surprise there. As uh, thousands of carers across Scotland are struggling on a daily basis to maintain their living standards and a decent quality of life, yet again what we're seeing today is the Scottish Government not using the full powers available to the Parliament. And we really need to be clear in this debate, decision by the UK Government to, remove, to move from RPI to using CPI has resulted in a real drop in income for those households who can least afford it. The amendment from the Minister asserts that there is consensus among economists and statisticians that RPI is not a reliable measure. But members of this Parliament should note that only last month the House of Lords Economics Affairs Select Committee report said, and I quote, we disagree with the UK Statistics Authority that RPI does not have the potential to become a good measure of inflation. With the improvements to RPI recommended, we believe RPI would be a viable candidate for the single general measure of inflation. That doesn't sound like a consensus against using RPI to me. And the TUC does not agree with the Scottish Government either. In a recent TUC report warning about pickpocketing statistics, it's pointed out that the evidence quoted by the UK Government and now by the Scottish Government to support CPI use is very weak. Housing costs are an important part of everybody's expenditure in Scotland, as we know, yet they are not included in CPI calculations, whereas the RPI does include them. The TUC points out that RPI is based more tightly around the spending patterns of workers than CPI. The RPI excludes most expenditure by pensioners dependent on state pensions, by tourists and by the ultra-wealthy. And further, the RPI and CPI use different statistical methods, and this matters, as the TUC points out. In a detailed report by Dr Mark Courtney, the key finding is that almost 80% of the difference between RPI and CPI is caused by the fact that CPI underestimates the real change in the cost of living facing workers. The rising cost of living, financial pressures in households is adding to an unacceptable gap between rich and poor in this country. Between those who can afford to provide and eat three meals a day and those who can't. Between those who can clothe their families and those who can't. And between those who can afford to travel to visit frail relatives and those who can't. For carers already working long hours providing essential support and care, a small increase in income is so significant. So I would disagree with what Alec Cole-Hamilton just said. 
And as it accumulates year on year, it can make the difference for better food, for a warmer home or for being part of community activities. Raising, uh, sorry, overall, it seems that organisations that take our money, presiding officer, use the higher inflation figure, RPI, whereas those paying us use the lower figure, the CPI. Our social security system should be based on the RPI measures. It might not be perfect, but it is the best measure that we have. And given that the majority of carers are women, I presume that a full equality impact assessment has been undertaken on the differential impact of using the lower inflation figure CPI for uprating. And I would ask the Minister to confirm findings in this regard and summing up. President Officer, most members in this chamber will speak warm words about supporting carers, but actions speak louder than words. And that means taking action in Scotland now, using all of our powers to raise the living standard of carers. We can do that, and we can do it now, and we should do it. Yeah. Thank you. Fulton McGregor, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Officer. And I'll start by saying that social security is a human right, and as such, at the core of Social Security Scotland, we see the principles of dignity, fairness and respect. Social security is indeed an investment in the people of Scotland. And I'm pleased that we have a fraction of these powers uh, that, that have been devolved to us. However, I would certainly uh, like to see this increased, as has been said in the Chamber before, um, and as a means for the Scottish people to escape the UK version of Social Security through the DWP. And I, and I would have, I'm not going to have time, I'm um, sorry, but I would have liked to see the Labour amendment, um, uh, the Labour motion today, uh, looking at that, and that's something that, that certainly we could get behind. There is a large diversity in carers and then they come from all backgrounds and are faced with a, a large array of challenges. I noticed this as a regular attender at the, the Lanarkshire Carers Forum, which meets in Cope Bridge on a, a monthly basis. And the, some of the, 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 the challenges that carers are faced with and both strenuous emotional and physical demands, but also financial, which is sometimes overlooked. And many carers give up their careers and professional opportunities to care and then find themselves struggling financially. And this is why the carers allowance supplement was introduced in recognition of the vital contribution that carers make to society. And I was quite taken uh, with, with, with uh, Miles Briggs uh, speech earlier and it reminded me um, when I was a teenager myself and uh, as a family we looked after um, uh, my gran and it's just something that we did and there wasn't any sort of you know anything put in around it. It was just everybody everybody mucked in in that situation and I think that uh, that is important that that's happening every single day and that it should be recognised. Uh, through the Cares Allowance Supplement, as uh, the Minister has said, an additional 442 has been put into over 77,000 carers last year, an increase of 13 per cent in investment in Scotland's carers of over 33 million. And in 1920, this will rise to £452.40 a year, and this is money going straight to carers. And, and I probably, like other MSPs in the Chamber, have heard some really positive feedback relating to the, the way it's been rolled out. One carer who relayed the story to me spoke of a very positive experience being entitled to an allowance and was so uplifted that she wasn't required to fill out any forums eh, or prove that she was a carer as because she, she had, was already a registered carer and that was a, enough for her to automatically qualify. And I'm sure we can agree that when you're a carer, one of the last things you want to do is spend time filling out long, intrusive forums to get something that, that basically you're, you're entitled to. And the carer, um, this particular carer, also noted that this was a very dignified approach, uh, backed up by a letter which was worded positively. She commented on the, uh, the coming in a white envelope as opposed to a brown one. Uh, and I know that, uh, as I said earlier, I think other, others will have had similar uh, experiences related to them. Presiding officer, I know that we're cut to three and a half minutes, so I just want to go straight to uh, where I was going to conclude. And I want to mention a fantastic young carer from my constituency, 17-year-old uh, Megan Boss. Megan cares for both her parents on a daily basis while continuing her studies at Cobridge High. And it was no wonder that, that Megan was recently awarded with the Inspirational Young Woman of the Year Award. And like many young carers, Megan looked after herself and her parents from a young age, but did so in silence until she met Action for Children at School Assembly and finally got the support she needed. This allowed Megan the opportunity to socialise and take part in clubs, something normal, teen, most normal teenage, teenagers would take for granted. But it's made such a big difference to our life, and I think it's important that we recognise the role of young carers in our society. And I'll end by just wanting to put on record uh, the opportunity again to congratulate Megan on her award. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour, followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I um, agree with one comment made by Mark Griffin? In his speech, and that is what we're talking about today, is a wider issue around carers and caring. And I think it is important that we do widen out 
uh, this debate. Um, I think everyone will um, rightly say how much we rely on unpaid carers within this country. And as previous speakers have already said, we simply could not meet that cost if it wasn't for sacrifices that some of them have made. For example, I wouldn't be here today speaking in this debate if it wasn't for an unpaid carer helping me this morning to get ready. And as we do widen this debate, um, I would like to suggest that we do need to come together uh, across different political parties and over time, not just immediately, but over time, look at how do we develop this and how do we bring more people on board and give more people support. Because I think the system is good, but I think it could be better and I think it could reach more people without necessarily increasing the cost dramatically. And can I, in my short intervention, just give three areas that I would welcome cross-party discussions on as we go forward in the in years ahead. The first one was picked up by um, Alison Johnson. And that is the a criteria that you have to reach 35 hours before you get any payment made to you. For, for many people, that is a very high figure, a very high number. Now, I do understand why it's there, and I can understand the rationale behind it. But there will be people who care for people 20, 25, other hours over that. And I do wonder whether it is worth, um, again, cross-party some work doing on whether there could be some tiering system to the benefit. Now, I appreciate that becomes administratively very difficult and much more difficult to implement. The advantage of the 35 hour is that it's very straightforward in many ways to implement. But I do think there are many carers um, across Scotland who provide vital care below that 35 hour period that are simply being missed out. And I think it is worth at least exploring to see whether there could be a tiered payment. The second area is in regard to the person who's been cared for has to be on benefit before that carer can get the money. I do have think that discriminates against certain individuals, particularly older people um, and other individuals who may have a, 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 an illness, may have a disability, but it doesn't get them into a recognised benefit, but they still need care help. And again, I appreciate the administration behind that will make it more difficult uh, and we don't want to make the system over bureaucratic but I do think we have to look at and see whether there are people there who aren't on benefits but are being cared for. And the third area and this particularly applies to younger carers um, and that is in regard to the travelling time to give that care. Um, we've taken evidence um, in the Social Security Committee that there are young carers who maybe are studying in Glasgow, but their parent lives in Edinburgh and are traveling through two or three times a week. But the traveling time between Glasgow and arriving at the parental home and then going back to wherever they're staying in Glasgow is not included in that 35 hours. And that can often add a lot more time. And I do think we need to just take that into consideration. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Joanne Lamont, followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. From the very establishment of the Scottish Parliament, unpaid carers have ensured that their voices were heard. We were told about what they do, what they save this country, and how important it is that people recognise the role that they play in looking after their um, loved ones. From the very beginning of the Parliament, they have imposed their demands upon us, and it is essential that we continue to listen to them. We now know, of course, that the impact of cuts to public services, to social care, that slack in our communities is, as we speak, being picked up by unpaid carers in increasing amounts. It is essential, therefore, that we, do go, we don't just say how much we care about carers. Across the Parliament, I have no doubt that we all care about unpaid carers and want to make a difference to their lives. But it is not good enough simply to settle for the warm words. We have to do the heavy lifting, particularly in government, of translating that into a real difference in people's lives. Now, I hear what Alec Cole Hamilton has said and what Jeremy Balfour has said about the broader questions. But we shouldn't make good the enemy of excellence. We're not pretending in this motion that we're going to transform 
the lives of carers completely. There is an issue about carer centres and the support that they are giving. There is an issue about the way in which the system looks after young carers and so on. This is a very simple proposal that would make a difference right now to the lives of unpaid carers. Why on earth would we resist it? It is a simple proposal. It doesn't pretend to transform people's lives completely, but we know it will make a difference. We know in here, we all know that George Osborne and the UK Tory government chose, chose to change the up rating from RPI to CPI. It was done with the active intention of cutting the costs of benefits, and that would have a direct impact yep. on carers. We know that. That is why they did it, and it's why many of us thought this government would resist continuing that kind of uprating. And I have to say, I am not easily shocked or taken aback by what is said in this place. But I have to say, I never thought I would see the day when a Scottish government minister would pray in aid the Bank of England in justifying an uprating approach that directly has consequences for unpaid carers in our communities. And what the government minister has chosen, she has chosen to settle for a process, a process argument in the face of an issue of principle. The reality is that a party that claimed to be able to set up a new state in 18 months now has put this issue in a it's too difficult, it's too difficult, it's too expensive box. They have returned £6 million of our money to the DWP with a contract that prevents those very powers being able to be varied to do things differently here. I wonder what equality impact assessment was made on that contract, which is now preventing the Scottish Government making choices that would live up to their claims for carers in the past. As I said at the beginning, warm words are not enough. We are not pretending that this proposal will change everything, but we are asking the Scottish Government to live up to their own language. Don't hide behind a process that's utterly inconsistent when rail fares can go up by RPI, but carers' allowance cannot, when the Scottish welfare budget Come is not close, even please. uprated by CPI. I would urge the government to understand it's a very simple decision and it will have an impact on the broader social security you must system close, in this country for a long time to come. James Dornan, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you very much, President Officer. I don't think there's anybody in the chamber that would argue against the point that the carers are an invaluable part of our society and that if we, if we didn't count on carers, then there'd be lots of people would be costing us a lot more money in institutions and in other places and hospitals and, and how they are looked after now. As Phil McGregor says earlier on, this is something that happens all the time. Many of us will have been brought up looking after somebody and not realising we were carers because they were part of our family. So nobody here is trying to play down the importance of carers and nobody here is trying to do anything but make sure that carers get the best deal possible. But I'm listening to the Labour Party here and I'm listening to them coming in two, three weeks late instead of coming in and run up to the budget and saying, this is the importance we put in carers. This is the amount of money we're going to put in carers. And this is where we're going to get that money from. It appears to me that the reason why they didn't do that was that they can now spend the next two years saying, you should be doing this, you should be doing, the next year, sorry, you should be doing this, you should be doing this, and not having to justify it by cost. It's like SNP plus a pound, and I think that's disgraceful. What we are doing here is we're trying to look after people. Ms. Lamont, it's quite clear Mr. Dornan's not taking your intervention. Three Please and a half minutes. It's quite clear that we've got children who get up in the morning, who have to look after people in the house, then get to school, then get to education, and we've got a responsibility to do everything we can for them. And we are trying to do our best. This government's done more than any other government in Scotland has ever done to raise the profile and to look after carers in, in such a way. What we should be doing is we should be looking to get a wider consensus around how we can make life as easy as possible. And it's not by raising it from CPI to RPI. And RPI is not a stable measure. And I suspect that what you'd be, what you'd be doing is, Elaine, if, if it had been RPI had been lowest and CPI has been highest, this debate by Mark, would, Mark Griffin would have been CPI should be it. 
that should be the level. What's happening here is we need to get round, what should be happening here is we need to get round the table. We need to look to see how we can look after carers in a completely holistic way and not be fighting about a pound or two, a couple of hundred pounds maybe over the course of a year, if it is that. And listen, please don't give me, please, please don't give me this, do you know what a couple of hundred pounds a year means to be poor? Because I do, because I have been poor. But what I do, what, but what I also want to say is that you're much better getting the problem resolved and then getting a long-term solution to it than you have just now. Yes, I will take you. Mark Griffin. I agree with the point that he makes. This is about um, a wider issue. This isn't just about carers. This is the first uprating measure we're talking about. We're talking about a precedent here of CPI when it comes to the full range of devolved benefits. And we don't want to see all of those people, not just a couple of pounds as he talks about for, for carers, but the full range of people who will de depend on social security in Scotland. This doesn't set a precedent for that. James Dornan, you have less than a minute. Yes, thank you. CPI is a more a sensible measure to be used because it's a more stable measure to be used. RPI is much more volatile and almost all the experts are saying that. Now, I, I, I had to laugh at, at, at Joanne Lamont saying, I can't believe that you used the Bank of England when she spent two years standing up with others defending the, what the Bank of England was saying when she was trying to make sure that we didn't get to run our own welfare affairs and social security affairs. I think it's important that we, we, that we look at this parliament. Alec Cole Hamilton, here's words I never thought I'd say. Alec Cole Hamilton's contribution was superb. It, it sort of hit the nail on the head. That's what we should be doing. I, I, I do hope that gets scrubbed from the record, but, but uh, it, he hit all the right notes, because that's what it should be about. It should be a, a holistic approach. It should be looking to see how, in the round, we can make life better for carers and not be scrambling over a pound or two uh, and a CPI or RPI. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Rising Officer. Well, this would appear to be a debate about the means rather than the ends. Um, and, and I hope that when we can move past this, we can focus on the ends, and that's about doing our best for carers. So by choosing the di to discuss the methodology of uprating, I believe Labour have wasted a bit of an opportunity to debate the needs of carers and how we might broaden it and, and sort of improve their opportunities by broadening our thinking. Because becoming a carer is rarely a planned life choice. For the majority of people, it is the result of life circumstances. And I personally have the utmost respect for the many men, women and children who, who care for their loved ones so selflessly and often to the detriment of their own lives. Because in my experience, they do so with little complaint and often very little help. So it is therefore right that as a parliament and as a society that we seek to support carers because without them both government and society would struggle. So that is why we supported and welcomed the introduction of the Carers Allowance Supplement, a living, breathing example of devolution in action, bringing benefit to the people of Scotland. And we do believe that Scottish ministers should be using the raft of powers devolved to this parliament to further explore ways to ensure carers receive a proper entitlement. So on this, Mr Griffin and I do agree. And I might therefore reasonably have expected Mr Griffin to be questioning the delay in devolving carers allowance or asking why the free bus pass for young carers won't be delivered until 2021. But what I probably didn't expect is that actually they would focus on the Carers Allowance Supplement being linked to RPI rather than CPI, because there is a body of evidence that says to the contrary. The Scottish Government, the UK Government and the ONS have all dismissed RPI as unfit for purpose in a sec, and indeed the ONS went on to say it is not suitable for use. While the Scottish Government have echoed their view that the formula is a very poor measure of inflation. I will take that. Elaine Smith. President officer, thank you for taking the intervention. But obviously the House of Lords Economic Committee have just said the opposite. They've said RPI could be used as the one measure. And there are Conservative members on that committee. So is Michelle Ballantyne disagreeing with them? Michelle Ballantyne. No, if you look at our amendment, what we're saying is these things should be explored. And the point here about what the committee said was that it could, but it would need to be changed in order to be fit for purpose. It is the present system that is fit, not fit for purpose. And if you look at what RPI does, it 
in including mortgages and housing, it subjects it to the volatility of the housing market. In 2008, when your government went out, people would have suffered under RPI because you'd crash the market. So, you know, we want a more stable measure that guarantees people's futures. And it's right that we look at it and we keep it under review, but it is not right that we just change it without thought. So my challenge is to you as, as a Labour bench is, is that uprating should be considered in an evidence-based manner, not just run at as a knee-jerk reaction. And we know that it was discussed during the Social Security Bill and we rejected it then. So we know we're, you're bringing it back again for a second bite. And I think we're giving you the same answer. So whilst SPICE may have produced an eye-catching number, I think you do need to go back and look at it in more depth and bring it as a more robust proposal. So we need to know exactly what the costs are. We need to know on what basis we reject the current evidence. We need to look at the, how the addition would impact the amount paid to the DWP under split competence, if you want it done soon. And we also need to look at things like how it would affect in recipients' income tax, a question that Mr. Griffin himself has raised in the past. So while I agree with your aims... must close, please. While I agree with your aims, I think it does need a lot more work. And that is why we are saying that it needs to be reviewed. It needs to be kept under review. We support you where the government close, is at please. the moment, and we think they've done the right thing. But that's not to say we don't keep looking at it. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Bob Doris. Uh, thanks very much, presiding officers. Others have done. Can I start by paying tribute to carers? Um, certainly from my own experience, I think it's worth putting on record that quite often carers themselves can be vulnerable individuals. Quite often there's codependency relationships in terms of health needs and disabilities and carers, you know, don't always, uh, aren't always in the best of health themselves. So it's a, it's a very picture out there, I know from personal experience, uh, the, the absolute essential jobs that, that, that carers do. Can I welcome the debate actually uh, on the 15% of the power over benefits that does sit in this place? Look forward to the day where the other 85% is also returned to this place also. But the Scottish Government has made good progress with those 15% of powers. We've, we've introduced the Best Start grant, going far further than the UK Government has previously done in relation to that, and also a similar vein in relation to funeral assistance and, and support there. It would appear to folk watching were arguing about whether to use CPI at 2.4% to uprate uh, carer's allowance and supplement, or uh, the higher figure currently, as of this year, of RPI, but I think that would be a wrong way to look at it, because actually, if you want to look at a number, the number you have to look at is the 13% increase the Scottish Government has given to carers with the carers supplement, an additional £37 million. And actually, after tomorrow, hopefully, that'll be £452.40p to every carer across the country additional. That's not 2.2% or 3%, that's 13%. And Labour shouldn't muddy the waters over that during today's debate. Um, crucially, uh, the Scottish Government's confirmed that in different years, CPI was higher than RPI, and other years, RPI was higher than CPI. So I would like to turn the debate on its head a little bit. And, and I actually think that Mark Griffin was helpful when he said £3 million would be the price tag. In, in, in relation to this, I'd like some inf more information in relation to that. And I actually commend Mark Griffin, and only because of time constraints, John Lamont, I do apologise. Actually, I commend Mark Griffin in suggesting three million more for carers, because that's essentially what, what Mr Griffin is doing. And I would hope that, that had that been part of a, a credible budget dialogue with the Scottish Government just a few weeks ago, that might actually have been secured. It would seem a fairly reasonable request, but you know, I would point out less cash for more cash for carers means less cash for somebody else and you have to have that discussion in the round and that leads us to discussion around why Labour did not suggest this as part of their budget process and I will return to that uh, later. It also leads us to that discussion about if you had £3 million more to spend for carers, how would you, spe how would you spend it? And I chair the Social Security Committee in this, the, this, this Parliament and Mark Griffin's a, a, a very valued member of, of that committee. We've looked at the Young Carers Grant and had a round table with young carers in relation to that. We've looked at the possibility of awarding more money to a second young carer. We've looked at going 
lifting the age limit. We've looked at young carers in full-time education. We've looked at the wider package of respite care. We've looked at unpaid and unidentified carers. And the reason I raise that is because to do more on that would cost money. And Alec Cole Hamilton made that point about looking at the package for carers in the round. So if the discussion Labour wants us to have is let's find from somewhere three million additional pounds for carers, let's have that dialogue, happy to have it on the Social Security Committee as well. But what I feel is what we're getting here today is not a considered plan from Labour, not a strategic plan from Labour, but yeah. political opposition and posturing for yeah, yeah. Uh, their own narrow benefit here yeah, this yeah. afternoon. And that disappoints me. But I get it. That's politics, Labour. I don't like it, but that's politics, Labour. Uh, and we are politicians in this place. But despite that, what I do commit to do is on the Social Security Committee is to continue to have that constructive and vibrant and progressive debate about how we best support all carers as part of that wider package. And I'll do that without any party politics whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. We move to the closing speeches and I call Brian Whittle for up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the chance to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Because it does give us the opportunity uh, across the Chamber once again to recognise the value of carers, both in the work they do and providing the care to, the, to uh, uh, family and friends. And also recognises that we need to continue that consideration of how we deliver an effective package of support to them. I think although it, it does seem uh, rather crass to mention uh, the monetary value of the work that they do uh, to, in, in, to the economy, it is an important statistic to keep in mind. And although money is not the reason they find themselves in a caring role, uh, Miles Briggs did highlight the fact that it's worth some £10 billion to the Scottish economy. Also, like Miles uh, Briggs, I have uh, attended the Young Carers Conference uh, weekend. Uh, it's rather enlightening and it gives us the opportunity to hear directly from young carers themselves. It gives us a chance to sit around the table for them to ask us questions and put their points uh, to us. And boy, do they. Uh, and I have to say, I find that uh, particularly refreshing and, and quite enjoyable. And I think one story sticks in my mind, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it was around a young carer who has to go and pick up a uh, prescription for uh, the parent that she, uh, that she is looking after. She has to get on the bus, uh, she has to go into town and then get the return trip back. And that costs her five pounds. And that's the reality of, of, of the life of that carer. It's time out of her day, but it's also time uh, money out of her pocket. And I think that's why uh, the introduction of uh, that, that free uh, bus travel in 2021 is so particularly important. So I want to mention a couple of contributions in a short time. I think uh, a, a number of uh, uh, contributors across the room, Alison Johnson, Miles Briggs and Alice Hamilton, noted the fact that, that there are situations where carers don't recognise they're in a caring role. I think that is an incredibly important point. So we do need to establish uh, a better way of identification and making sure we get the support to them. I also wanted to, to pick up on Bob Doris's point and say to just, just hi gently highlight to him that you do have a third of working age benefits uh, available to you. Uh, stop hiding behind the 15% uh, because uh, you're not counting um, uh, pensions in that, of course. Um, I have to say that... Um, uh, Go on then. Bob Doris. Given the invidious predicament of WASPY women, would you then uh, celebrate pensions being brought back to this parliament under the con democratic control of the, the Scottish parliament rather than the cuts to pensions the Tories are doing at Westminster? Brian Whittle. You have the ability. You have the ability now. You, you've had the ability now for three, three years. You were given a third of the, the working age benefits and the first thing you did was give them back to Westminster and then you had to put them back for another two years. You have the ability. Guess what? You found out that welfare Mr. is Mr Whittle, difficult. can I remind you, you should always direct your conversations through the chair, please. Through the chair. Um, <laughs> Mr Whittle, I'm serious. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, please sorry, do not speak directly to each other, particularly sorry, in interventions in that way. Brian Whittle. Um, I think, given the consensus across this chamber and, and the need to look at how we increase uh, support for carers, I think, like Michelle Ballantyne said, I'm kind of left with the feeling that this is an opportunity missed. I think there's a certain lack of ambition quite frankly, in the Labour motion. And I think the approach to me is without any real creative thought. I think where we're looking at ways to put more money into the pockets uh, and recommends, recompense the work that they do, we should also be looking at other avenues that are available to us. Because it's not just about the money that goes into the pockets, it's also about how much things cost. 
I would like to see concessionary travel, uh, uh, you know, the, the possibility of concessionary travel expanded out into, into all carers, uh, or perhaps even written into the contract as part of a tender process, that ability to keep them connected, uh, as has been highlighted to me by many carers. Is it also possible, perhaps, uh, to get access to public facilities, facilities, allowing them to keep active? There are many, I'm presenting officers, much more we could say. Unfortunately, it's a very short debate, so I shall leave my contribution there. Thank you. Kate Forbes, up to four minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, officer, and can I start by agreeing with many other speakers in paying tribute to carers, and I do so seeing firsthand the hard work, the sacrificial care, and the challenging environment that many of them work in. And that's why the Labour Party have said that actions speak louder than warm, empty words. And that is why this government has put more money into the pockets of carers, why this government has introduced a new benefit for young carers, and why this government has committed to supporting the rights of carers. And that's also why the Labour Party do carers a disservice in this debate by making it about inflationary indexes. I thought we'd seen enough of the Labour Party's financial illiteracy over the course of the last few weeks, but less than a week after stage three of the budget, it is a back. Yep. For clarity, inflation is the cost of living. The process of uprating is to ensure that social security payments keep up with the cost of living. And for the Labour Party to suggest we adopt what is widely deemed to be a more inaccurate measure of inflation, simply simply because it is anticipated to overestimate price rises is not just wrong, but it's unfair. Is the Labour Party aware, is, is Mark Griffin aware that in previous years RPI has been sit down. higher sit down. than CPI sit down. and that the whole point of inflationary down, indexes is that they can change? There's a place for debate about the appropriate level of payments. Let's have that debate and I will take an intervention from whoever stands up fastest. Yep. Uh, I think it was Mark Griffin. Thank the, the member for Mark, giving, I think Mark Griffin. Thank the minister for giving way. Perhaps she can explain why hard-pressed train commuters are forced to live with RPI increases to fares, while carers won't get a similar uplift in their carers' allowance. Minister. Thank Mark Griffin for that question. And it's a fair question. And the reason is that in 2013, so train fares are increased by RPI because it's a historical use. And in 2013, there was a review of UK price indices. And the review's recommendation stated quite clearly that RPI was a flawed statistical measure of inflation, which should not be used for new purposes and that government regulators should work towards ending the use of RPI as soon as is practicable. The clear point here, and it needs to be recognised, these are not my words, these are experts, RPI is more erratic. And the whole point here is, let's have a debate about how much uh, carers should be paid, but to link it to ind indices and inflationary indices is, is counterproductive and it is flawed. That, that debate, the debate about payments to carers, is completely and utterly different from the debate on inflationary uprating, yep. which is a reflection of the cost of living. We need to recognise those costs, and therefore it needs to be evidence-led. Presiding officer, this is the important thing in this debate. We value carers. We are doing everything we can to support carers, but we will not jeopardise that support by using a flawed and counter productive reproach. Now, to close, presiding officer, one of the interventions I made earlier, the Scottish Parliament has carefully considered and scrutinised the Scottish budget over the last three months, including a wide range of committee evidence, sessions and debates in this chamber. That process resulted in the approval last Thursday of £42.5 billion budget supporting the use of our new devolved social security uh, responsibility powers. During the Stage 3 budget debate on Thursday, the Labour Party demanded additional money to be allocated to a whole range of commitments, as is their right, including local government, child poverty, etc. And there was no clarity on how any of those commitments would be funded. Pauline McNeill, who I believe is going to close, mentioned that she welcomed the Carers' and, and Allowance Supplement. And you must supplement. conclude. Why has that changed in less than Thank a Thank you very much. I call on Pauline McNeill to close for Labour. Ms McNeill, five minutes, please.
All members have recorded our deepest thanks and respect to the millions of carers across the country and the 29,000 young carers under 16. One in five people give up work to care for people. It is an act of huge selflessness and an act of love. We welcome the support of the Greens to our motion today and we hope to persuade perhaps the Liberal Democrats that this is the right thing to do. We know that carers come from a wide diverse range of backgrounds. If you are in full-time education such as college or university, you're not eligible to receive carers allowance, even although you're unlikely to be able to hold down part-time work due to caring, but yet have additional financial stresses. We have the power to act and this is the forthcoming debate that we should have of where we should use the powers to elaborate on the carer's allowance and the carer's supplement. Let me begin to answer um, Kate Forbes by pointing out, in case she is unclear, that what Labour are arguing for today is a question of principle in our view, uprating of the carer's allowance going forward is about the mechanism we choose to have confidence in, and members on this side of the House believe, that the RPI best reflects the cost of living, and it's not just these members here who have confidence, it's the carers groups themselves that have the most confidence in RPI. It is a critical point going forward. There's a statutory instrument coming forward to the committee tomorrow. The government have the choice of relaying it if they so wish. We will welcome the devolution of the carer's allowance and we do welcome the carer's supplement, but let me address some points in detail. The Labour motion calls for RPI to be used as the uprating mechanism because we believe that is the most beneficial way of uprating for members. Far from being a trivial matter of a few hundred pounds that Mr Dornan referred to earlier, our figures show that since 2010, that is a figure of nearly £1,000. So apparently there are historical reasons why RPI was used for train fares. Do the Scottish Government not believe their own position? It's a new agency. We set new precedents. We're asking you to set a new precedent. The Cabinet Secretary painstakingly tried to justify the adoption of CPI quoting statisticians and opinions shared by some organisations. What further evidence does this Scottish Government need that the CPI was adopted by George Osborne in 2010, a man who is widely distrusted by you, Cabinet Secretary and Minister, and you've quoted it in many debates. Do you want evidence? There's, my, there's the beginning of my evidence. The carers' increase should cover actual inflation costs, and we believe this is the mechanism that does it. So uh, I take the intervention. Do you support or do you uh, think George Osborne now, is a good before you, before you say anything, the term you is used by the chair here, not by members. My colleague has just told you off about it. We will not give up Roger. on this. Minister. I, I want to support carers to ensure that they have enough and sufficient money to meet the cost of living. And to do that, we need to make sure that the index we use is evidence-led. The UK Statistics Authority, the Office of National Statistics, the Bank of England, and I could go on if we had more time, all claim that RPI is flawed. Should we really be using a flawed system to support our carers? ...themselves do not have confidence in this mechanism. Earlier on, the Minister asked why Labour did not ask for this in the budget. Well, I would say to the ministers here, why do you need to be asked? Why do you need to be asked not to use the CPI as the mechanism adopted by George Osborne? Alec Cole Hamilton seemed to be almost persuadable in this. I don't know. I'm sure you're not flattered by Mr Dornan's uh, earlier praise of your speech. I would ask the Liberal Democrats to look, to look at the... Um, I think I've only got a minute left, actually. Yes, the, I'm afraid the member's concluding in a short debate. I would have taken it otherwise. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton, I, I would ask the Liberal Democrats to consider that there is evidence to show that because CPI was adopted in 2010, there have been substantial losses in that period of time. And I hope the Liberal Democrats would consider that this small difference overall, I do apologise to members, there is a very short debate. We believe in what we're doing here. We believe it is a matter of principle. There is more work to be done. We have welcomed the Scottish Government's work on this. You have a chance to reverse this and do the right thing. Thank you, and that concludes that debate. And I want members to very quickly get down and take their positions for the next debate with very little time in hand.